So first of all, good, uh, good morning, everybody. I would like to thank the VHL organization as well as the organizing committee for the invitation. It's really great pleasure and truly honor to be here today. And today I'm going to present, you know, some results that were generated, I would say, at the NIH, but also in the collaboration with uh, some of our investigators, uh, not only outside the NIH, but also internationally. And I also would like to thank my mentors, and especially we have a Dr. Uh, Marcel Linehan here, uh, from whom I received uh, very good support and guidance, especially, you know, when I started, you know, the first step, uh, learning something about the pheochromocytoma. Mm -hmm. as well as paraganglioma here at the uh, NIH. When we go to pheochromocytoma paraganglioma definition, because, you know, I will give you some update about the pheochromocytoma paraganglioma, I will give you some something what I think it's actually new. Uh, we know that there are neuroendocrine tumors, so we heard about that many times, and they synthesize, metabolize, release uh, catecholamines, and their metabolites. But the metabolites will be very important, and I will mention it later on. The incidence just now it's approximately eight cases per one million, uh, and doubled from uh, 95 to 2015. But this is question uh, uh, with uh, with the question because you know we have a very good uh, actually surveillance these patients these days, and we have a much better imaging studies and programs and everything you know related to those patients so it's really very difficult to say whether you know the incidence doubled but what is important and i said before that the biochemical diagnosis is really based on the measurement of catecholamine metabolites we call them metanephrines and methoxytyramine, and I will talk about that, and we can measure them either in plasma or urine, and these tumors are also slow growing with a volume doubling approximately for five to seven years, and I think it was mentioned, I think even today, you know, that those tumors are really very slow growing, you know, so there is sometimes not in a hurry, absolutely, you know, to, uh, to for example, operate on uh, patients with these tumors. And they have a very strong heredity risk um, uh, and uh, compared to all the neur neur endocrine neoplasts, approximately 35%. And now all pheochromocytomas, paragangliomas uh, are considered to have metastatic uh, potential. And uh, uh, Dr. Mente talk about that, you know, about you know, the uh, new definition of the pheochromocytoma and paragangliomas. And everybody knows there is no cure for metastatic uh, disease. When we talk about the clinical characteristics are a little bit different these days, you know, how we will look at them. This is definitely not, for example, hypertension or headache, you know, that, that would distinguish, you know, group uh, of those patients that they have a pheochromocytoma, they don't have a pheochromocytoma. But uh, based on the one of the latest publication, especially came from uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Garola and Dr. Landers, you know, there are certain, you know, the, um, I would say, signs and symptoms that are very important. For example, patients are presenting with palpitations, setting tremor, weakness, paleness, but they have also weight loss uh, despite having constipation. And they are sometimes presenting with nausea, vomiting. And this is typical, especially for younger patients. So um, I put here that if pheochromocytoma paraganglioma patients have uh, more than or, you know, three symptoms and signs, for example, you know, profile sweating, palpitation, pale, tremor, and nausea. And this is combined with low uh, um, uh, body mass index that is approximately less than 25 uh, uh, kilogram per square meter. And with heart rate that is over 85, they have a 7.5 fold uh, uh, increase uh, uh, to have actually pheochromocytoma or paraganglioma. So it's not hypertension that used to be, because as we know that the population of the patient, I mean, the, the general population, for example, here in the United States, has the hypertension approximately in a 30, 35%. When we look at the continuing progress and when we look at the genetics and some molecular signature, you can see so, so how many genes we have just now in the latest one. 
And it was discovered is SUCLG2 that was discovered in 2022. But what is important, and it came just now a few weeks ago, actually in uh, collaboration with Dr. Todd Hill. Dr. Todd Hill actually, you know, lead the whole group, and we collaborated uh, with his group as well as with Patricia Dahia, uh, Lauren Fishbein, and others. You know, we have uh, just now seven clusters, which is very interesting, you know, and. Uh, Mm, because before we had, uh, let's say, three main clusters, but just now we have a seven, seven clusters that are very important. And the VHL is really standing out, you know, from, for example, and those that they are related either to Krebs cycle, but uh, especially hypoxia signaling pathway, for example, the EPAS or hif alpha uh, related pheochromocytoma paraganglioma. What is also interesting that this study this is one of the first study, but there are also some other studies as well. Now, this study very nicely outlined, you know, what can be in these tumors in terms of uh, the immune micro environment. And I put uh, here, you know, some data related to, for example, the VHL that they have, you know, for example, uh, the CD4 uh, plus T cells. They have a plasma B cells. Of course, you know, all the tumors, they have a, a macrophages, and I will talk a little, a little bit about that later on. So uh, if we talk about the new germline SUCLG2 variants, that, that was discovered just, you know, recently, and is a uh, position in the Krebs cycle. And there is uh, something, uh, the enzyme, which is called succinate coenzyme A ligase. And this enzyme converts succinyl coenzyme A into succinate and generation ATP and GTP. This is only the place that GTP is actually generated. And there are two subunits, alpha subunit and um, beta subunit, but uh, the beta subunit is very important. And if it is related to SUCLG2, it's generating actually GTP. And so we actually tested approximately 352 patients, and we found that uh, those patients, eight of them, they have a germline SUCLG mutation. So it's approximately 4% or slightly above the 4%. But what is important when we look at the Krebs cycle, and I will talk about it as well later on, that the Krebs cycle is interesting that the patients with, uh, with mutation in the Krebs cycle actually presenting uh, with either pheochromocytoma or paraganglioma more towards the extra adrenal tumor. They have a, a very high incidence of metastatic disease. And you can see here that approximately half of these patients have metastatic disease. And what is also important that everything what is related to Krebs cycle has typical biochemical phenotype here is not adrenergic biochemical phenotype. Also, what is what was interesting and what we cannot actually answer just now, or we don't know very very good explanation, that these mutations are actually related to decrease the SDH activity, and this is actually profound activity. So this is how this like this patient would present that they have a SDH. Uh, uh, mutation because succinate fumarate ratio, as you see, it's a, it's pretty high and SDH activity is low. So we don't know exactly what is the mechanism, but it's definitely, you know, some link uh, between this mutation and uh, SDHA. Uh, and most likely, you know, in the future, we will be able to say something more about, you know, what can be actually the mechanism and what is happening with these patients. So, but nevertheless, you know, even I told you about about, you know, seven new clusters, I have to say that for our clinical practice and for clinicians, it's the most important to consider two main clusters. And this is actually from pioneering work um, of Patricia Dahia, uh, who suggested actually those clusters and the link of the hypoxia uh, to pheochromocytoma paraganglioma is the cluster one. Now that is related, uh, as I mentioned before, Krebs cycle as well as hypoxia and cluster two uh, kinase signaling. So when we talk actually about the cluster one is divided to cluster one A and cluster one B. The cluster one A is typical Krebs cycle, cluster one B 
uh, are those uh, uh, patients who have a mutation in the hypoxia signaling pathway here, and you have you you heard about that many many times, practically in every talk about the HIF, uh, especially HIF two alpha, uh, prolehydroxylases, as well as uh, VHL. So how those patients are actually presenting? So they have extra adrenal tumors, except for the VHL. I told you about the noradrenergic biochemical phenotype and they are highly metastatic and very aggressive. So before we thought that SDHB is the worst one and B, you know, I always say that B is as a bad and, you know, the metastatic potential is up to 40%. It depends what you read. But right now we have a data and especially those data came for the large population of patients, you know, from the NIH. And we can see that the patient with SDHA mutation have a high uh, metastatic potential up to approximately 70%. Uh, 70%. So uh, that is actually worrisome. And those patients are very complicated, difficult in terms of uh, actually treatment. So what is also important, if these tumors are bigger, larger than approximately four centimeter, and it's especially for SDHB, I don't think that we have a very good data for SDHA. They have a very high metastatic potential. What is important also surveillance, because surveillance for these patients is very, very crucial and improve outcomes of the of the patients. And I'm not only talking about, for example, SDHX, but I'm also talking about, for example, VHL patients. When we talk about the VHL, as you know, the type 1, type 2, I will not go through that. I will not go through missense and truncating pathogenic variants because you heard quite a lot about that. Uh, but what is in the important? At approximately 20% of cases, they have a de novo pathogenic variants. And if you have the VHL mutation, how common is pheochromocytoma paraganglioma? It, it depends what you read. You know, the number is approximately 20, 25%. But we have also some other studies like Canadian study that show that it's up to 40%. So really, you know, it depends, you know, on the region, on the number of the patients and how the patients are actually evaluated. So I would say that between 20 to 40 percent will be actually a reasonable number. Then you go to kinase signaling. Of course, you know you know something about the MEX gene, TMEM 127. Red, red oncogene, they are a little bit different because they are usually adrenal, they are rarely metastatic, and what is very important, they always have an adrenergic biochemical phenotype. They cannot uh, actually present with noradrenergic biochemical phenotype. They can have a combination of elevated norepinephrine or normethanephrine and epinephrine and methanephrine, but they always have a, you know, so adrenergic biochemical uh, phenotype. There are some interesting patients, and some somebody talked about that, uh, I think, today and also yesterday about the pheoparaganglioma and polycythemia. Yes, there are some patients. There are not too many patients. And at the beginning, of course, you know, there were some very interesting discoveries and you know, published from French group about prolhydroxylase and how, you know, the mutation in prolhydroxylase can actually lead to pheochromocytoma or paraganglioma associated with uh, polycythemia. The reason is that those mutations actually um, result in problematic or the abnormal uh, binding to HIF. And uh, of course, you know that if there is uh, no hydroxylation of the HIF, uh, the VHL cannot be actually bound as well. And therefore, HIF actually uh, is uh, moving, you know, from the cytoplasmatic pool uh, to the nucleus and affecting many genes that are related uh, to pathogenesis of many tumors. And I think Dr. As Amenza mentioned, you know that there are hundreds of genes that are related actually to HIF, whether it's HIF-1 alpha or HIF-2 alpha. Here we are talking mainly about, you know, HIF-2 alpha. Now, what is important when we talk about the polycythemia, that the polycythemia, of course, comes, you know, with the EPO production. And the EPO production is important, you know, in the kidney, if, you know, the uh, individual has, you know, higher degree of hypoxia that goes, you know, to the liver. But there are also some other pools or some other cells that they can actually 
produce, for example, erythropoietin, and glial cells, neurons, uh, for example, some retinal cells. So we describe actually a new syndrome of eochromocytoma paraganglioma uh, together with polycythemia and duodenal somatostatinoma that was related to HIF2 alpha gain of function mutation. At the beginning, I think that there were two, uh, two uh, patients that were published in 2012, and later on in 2013, they, we publish, you know, so, uh, six patients. What is interesting that most of these patients, they are females, they start very uh, early with the polycythemia. They start with polycythemia even before the tumors can be actually detected. So it's obvious that the erythropoietin is coming from somewhere else. And I can tell you honestly, we still don't know from where the erythropoietin is coming, although it's partially coming from these tumors, because when we operate on these patients and um, tumors are removed, Mm, definitely the erythropoietin uh, goes down and uh, patients are um, improving. But what I wanted to say here, you know, all the patients uh, practically presenting with multiple tumors and most of them with metastatic tumors. But what is also new, you know, and what we did not know at the beginning, that those patients are presenting also with some visual problems. And he, uh, you, uh, here you can see uh, one of our patients, that was one of our first patients who presented, you know, with those problems. And later on, we actually put together, and especially in collaboration with um, NCI, Dr. Zhuang and his lab, um, that uh, the transgenic HIV to alpha gain of function mutant mouse model that confirm actually clinical findings. On the top of that, what is uh, even newest is there are also some new CNS malformation that uh, have been found actually in these patients that uh, we really did not know anything about those malformations when we published you know, initial articles. And you can see that there are several actually CNS malformations that are uh, actually uh, important to our patients and our patients presenting actually with those malformations. So I think that uh, HIF2 alpha is important. The player in, you know, it's almost like Achilles heel, you know, in some cancers and uh, serve as a very good, uh, um, I would say, model for uh, some targeted uh, new therapeutic options. And you heard a lot about Belzutifant and everything today. So I don't think that is necessary actually to repeat uh, this uh, uh, this part, but especially, you know, for these patients, I think that that's going to be uh, of the importance. What is also new in the genetics, you know, so as I mentioned before, 30%, 35% have a hereditary disease, 40% um, have somatic mutation. So in the future is question, you know, whether we should fear first look at the tumors and then to blood rather than look at the blood and then the tumors because we will be missing half of those patients. The lifetime penetrance for SDHB is about 45% and males are not doing so well. I have to say that males are doing actually a little bit worse than women in terms of, you know, the, uh, the penetrance. Also, and I mentioned it before, you know, when you have a SDHB pheochromocytoma paraganglioma compared to apparently sporadic uh, one, you know, everything what is for four centimeter or over is problematic. So be aware of that from clinical point of view, because you have to actually take the action. You have to operate on, not operate on the patient, but also to take the lead, you know, in terms of, uh, for example, follow up of those patients compared to apparently sporadic disease, when we go approximately with the tumor size between six and seven centimeter. Now, kidney cancer, and I'm pretty sure Dr. Lenehan mentioned quite a lot about, you know, as an expert in the kidney cancer, and especially as DH variants. But, uh, you know, before we saw that it's, you know, more common, but there is a new study actually, and it's actually suggesting it's a, li a little bit less common, you know, approximately between two and five cent, uh, two, two and five per person, because the, before we saw that it would be approximately uh, 10, uh, 10 percent. 
Children are doing better if they have a SDHB pheochromocytoma paraganglioma. And outside the uh, SDHB, there are some new data that are related to neurofibromatosis related pheochromocytoma. And uh, before we saw that the metastatic potential would be up to about 5%, 3 to 5%, but the new data are suggesting that it's much higher and it's approximately 7%. So what is new, you know, in terms of, you know, this genetic testing, you know, how we should follow up these patients. I will not go through everything, you know, because we would uh, spend a lot of, a lot of time. But I will also uh, only wanted to tell, tell you that, uh, the, as I mentioned, there are approximately 20, 25 different uh, pheoparaganglioma susceptibility genes uh, that are very important. And uh, they are actually... Uh, Mm, uh, mm, divide it uh, mm, the same way between, you know, the germline mutation and somatic mutation. So all patients with uh, those with mutations or pathogenic variants uh, should receive periodic surveillance, which is very important. Uh, here, you heard just now something about the VHL, how screening should be done. And I agree, the screening is between four and five years of uh, age. Uh, followed by annual metanephrine and blood uh, pressure measurement. So remember, we do, uh, we do actually metanephrines, but we also add the blood pressure measurement. Then anatomic imaging should start approximately between the age 15, 16. If somebody wants to do something in terms of imaging, the abdominal ultrasound is uh, actually allowed and it should be started approximately about the age uh, of the 10 years. So the metanephrines are uh, currently gold standard. Uh, I will not go through a lot of a lot of details. You know that metanephrines are metabolites of catecholamines, and why are uh, or why we prefer metanephrines over catecholamines? Because uh, approximately, and as I put here, seventy percent of these tumors release catecholamines into circulation due to intratumoral metabolism of catecholamines to metanephrines, as well as episodic secretion of catecholamines. So the catecholamines are released episodically, however, metanephrines are continuously. And again, to coming back to 70%, so this, the, the, there are some tumors that are so much efficient that you will never get any release of catecholamines approximately in 30% of patients, catecholamines will be always negative, but the metanephrines will be positive in approximately 98, 99% of patients. These are the new data. We, as you know, that we measure everything which is called free. Okay, so we are not uh, talking already about the fractionated or, you know, this way or that way. We are talking about, uh, only about plasma-free or urinary-free um, metanephrines. And if you look at the sensitivity of the metabolites, the sensitivity is slightly better for plasma. Specificity is practically the, uh, the same. But what is important and what is new just now that actually, although there is no consensus whether you go to urine or, you know, the plasma, experts agree that if there is increase in metanephrine two times above the upper reference limit, and before was three times above the upper reference limit. So remember, just now it's two times above the upper reference limit that suggests the presence of these uh, tumors. This is very interesting, you know, so if you follow me carefully, I think you will understand. So we have a, for example, patient with hypertension and hypertension is, you know, very common. I told you our patients have some symptoms and signs. So there is like, like a low likelihood of having pheochromocytoma paraganglioma. So the pretest probability is only approximately uh, one person. So if it, it depends, you know, how metanephrines are, uh, slash methoxytyramines are elevated. If they are elevated one time above the upper reference limit, you can see that the post-test probability is only 10%, very low. If it is, you know, for example, two times above the upper reference limit, again, two times, it's important, you will be at the level of 80%. Now we go to something that is uh, highly suggestive for pheochromocytoma paraganglioma, or is some, uh, for example, somebody has an incidentaloma, you know, genetic predisposition. 
And so the pretest probability will be between five to seven percent plus minus. And you can see that uh, if it is one times above the upper reference limit, uh, you know, the elevation of the metabolites would be already post-test probability about 50 percent. But uh, the uh, if it is uh, two times above the upper reference limit will be 100 percent, almost 100 percent. I think it's 100 percent, as you know. OK, so what is also important, what you should take, uh, you should know that uh, this and uh, other results strongly support that plasma metanephrine and methoxytyramines offer better diagnostic performance than urine tests for patients who have a li high likelihood of having pheochromocytoma. When you think that the patient really has a high likelihood, go rather to the plasma, then you, you would go to urine. Um, there is, you know, the biochemical test uh, th that can be sometimes equivocal. Something is in gray zone between the upper reference limit and two times above the upper reference limit. This is, uh, we can use the clonidine uh, suppression test and we actually modify clonidine suppression test to measure, uh, to measure actually the plasma normethanephrine. You can see the sensitivity specificity. But what is new here is H-related upper reference limit. That's what you have to know, especially, you know, when you are working with the pediatric population. And this is not related to metanephrine. This is not related to 3-methoxytyramine, but it's only related to normethanephrine. So you have to always look at it. What is the upper reference limit based on certain age? Because sometimes, you know, you can get a for example, false negative or false positive results. And just now, you know, a few, actually a few weeks almost, or maybe two months, you know, there are new published data that took this age-related upper reference limit to improve the diagnostic, actually, accuracy of clonidine suppression test with the sensitivity 9497 yeah, and uh, you you would say oh this is a little bit you know the same or even lower and not really because this is especially for the patient that they have a moderate you know elevation of normethanephrine because the first data about clonidine suppression tests were done uh, with the patient that they have a pretty high elevation of uh, plasma normethanephrine so uh, about the uh, risk factors for metastatic pheochromocytoma, you know the cluster one is worse than cluster two. You know, I will not go into that. But what is important that recent meta-analysis showed that, uh, and it was multivariate models, that SDHB is playing the role and also patients that they have a high norepinephrine or dopamine. However, if you look at the survival of those patients, it's especially age, because the patients that uh, they have, a, for example, they are older, they are not doing so well. And of course, if they have a metastatic lesions together with hypersecretion. There are some risk factors for metastatic pheoparaganglioma. I outlined them here. And they are different ones, you know, so we were talking about the oncometabolites, of course, genes, it's everything. But what I think that one of the most important factors, believe it or not, when we look at the, uh, because we are doing, you know, some algorithm for artificial intelligence and some application for the pheochromocytoma paraganglioma to be used um, as an app, you know, the size, size truly matter. And you would be surprised that SDHB plays a role, but does not play so important a role, you know, like, for example, the size of the pheochromocytoma slash paraganglioma. So be aware of that, especially when you have a patient with the bigger, you know, tumor to tell the patient that it's not only about the operation and removal of the tumor. It's about the surveillance, what I mentioned already uh, before. This is uh, something about the new future directions uh, to characterize immune cell infiltration signature because, you know, and I think uh, mm, uh, Osgur could talk about that, uh, uh, about, you know, what is useless in terms of, you know, the WHO, you know, certain, you know, so um, certain approaches that uh, were 
introduce uh, in the future. But uh, there are, of course, you know, certain histopathological criteria that are extremely important. But what I think that in the future we will have another, you know, criterion, and that will be, you know, the uh, the immune cell infiltration, the immune microenvironment. So we look at a certain number of tumors. We lo uh, look at also the TCGA, and we included 22 immune cell types, uh, and looking, you know, how actually these tumors. Uh, can be different and how we can predict the behavior of these tumors uh, uh, in, uh, in terms of um, uh, developing, for example, the aggressiveness or metastatic, uh, metastatic disease. And we finally uh, stratify them into the five immune clusters. And just, you know, for your information, for example, immune cluster three, you know, is characterized by, for example, kinase, uh, signaling. And you know, I told you about kinase signaling. It's very low metastatic potential, you know, versus, for example, uh, immune cluster 4 that includes uh, uh, those patients with SDH uh, tumors that they have, uh, they are associated with high metastatic uh, potential. So I think that pathologies in the future, and I cannot talk in, um, on behalf of pathologists because I am not the pathologist, but I, I very much feel that, uh, you know, on, on the top of the histopathology, they will actually tell us more about, uh, about the immune microenvironment of these tumors and, um, you know, some prognosis of this, uh, of this uh, patient that it will be used or transferred into cl clinical work. Um, and then I wanted to say, you know, the imaging, you know, we talk a little bit about the imaging today. Mm, of course, you know, you can have a MIBG because um, those tumors have no epinephrine transport system, or they have a somatostatin receptors, especially somatostatin receptor two. And you know that we are talking about teranostics. Teranostic is a very interesting term because, you know, put together diagnostic and therapeutics uh, uh, to, to, together because you have always the same pairs. And those pairs are very important, you know, because first you diagnose the tumor and based on that, you can use actually, uh, based on the uh, diagnosis and positive scan, you can actually think about the radiotherapy. But what is new just now and what you are sometimes uh, actually um, uh, to hearing or you have at your hospitals is to use not only, you know, the gallium dotatate, but uh, copper dotatate. And we did three patients. Unfortunately, I cannot give you the uh, results from VHL patients because it's still cooking and we don't have so many VHL patients just now. Mm, but... Uh, Maybe in the, in the uh, near future, we will have everything, but you can see, you know, that the results are pretty much comparable. What is different between the, the gallium and copper is that copper has actually half-life is much longer. So you can, for example, do, uh, do dosimetry, which is, you know, very, very important. And also you have more time for the scanning compared to, for example, if you are using gallium, Dotatate when the scanning has to be done in a certain time frame. And when we go to VHL, so this is about 11 year old male with VHL uh, PPGL actually. And you can see, you know, so we put together Floridopa, FDG, and Dotatate. And I understand. And what was said before, you know, that there were comparison between FDG and Dotatate, you know, with, you know, Dotatate performing pretty well. But when we look at the, uh, or where we add actually Fluorodopa, the Fluorodopa is definitely something that is, could be used uh, for patients or should be used for patients um, with uh, VHL related pheochromocytoma or paraganglioma. The problem is that not everybody has a fluorodopa. Actually, only very few centers have a fluorodopa in the US compared to, for example, Europe. But if we, when you look at this table and we included 12 patients uh, with 19 pheochromocytomas, you can see you know, how the fluorodopa is doing, overall detection rate, and uh, from the functional imaging is definitely the winner. 
uh, compared to you know some other function imaging but uh, you know if we compare it with the ct is pretty much the same and for the mri the mri would be of course better but as you know ct and mr uh, and, and mri as the anatomic imaging studies are not uh, uh, that's specific, you know, so you need something more specific to make sure that you are dealing with uh, pheochromocytoma, especially those that they are small, because those small pheochromocytomas related to VHL, very often, you know, the biochemistry is so, so, you know, so you have to be very careful, you know, so whether it's really pheochromocytoma, whether it's related, for example, drug effect. So, but uh, you have uh, definitely some options to distinguish between A or B, for example, to perform the clonidine suppression test. And so, so we put together the guidelines. And uh, as you see, you know, I will not go through cluster one, you know, because there's definitely Dota Tate, but look at the cluster two. Now the cluster two, together with the hypoxia signaling, which is actually cluster one B, what I told you before, is definitely fluorodopa. And the second, you know, the imaging uh, function imaging study should be, for example, MIBG. But if you are talking about metastatic, regardless what kind of the, the genetic background you will use, for example, the, the totatate scan. And for head and neck paragangliomas, very seldom you can get, you know, the VHL head and neck paragangliomas, you, you will use dotatate. Let's say you don't have anything else than the dotatate, you will still will be, will be fine, because this is an interesting study from Dr. Hahn that pulled together 215 patients, and they found that across all the pheochromocytomas, paragangliomas, regardless of their genetic background, regardless of whether, you know, it's pheoparagonglioma, dotatate score the highest, um, so you can use the dotatate scan, but again, you know, the fluorodopa, especially when you are not absolutely sure whether you will have, you know, some option to use it, I would definitely, definitely recommend that. And of course, you know, when we talk about teranostics, we have either Lutatera or Azedra. Lutatera is related to Dotatate uh, and uh, the Lutetium. Azedra is uh, related to iodine, uh, so-called MIBG, iodine 131. But if you look at the, the outcomes, the partial response stable disease is the same. Here is what is the most important, what we outlined actually last year, you know, so... Uh, the algorithm for patient with metastatic disease. Because let's say, you know, if somebody has, you know, this scan is better for, for example, for dotatate, yes, of course, you will use the lutatera for MIBG with azedra. But what are you going to do if everything is the same? You know, how you will approach the patient and you are deciding about the patient. The, the, this, the patient is in your hands. The outcome of the patient, you know, is in your hands and it's very complicated, difficult, you know, to make, you know, the right decision. So we think that there are certain reasons or um, uh, certain rules. And if, uh, of course, the most important rule is bone marrow reserve. So for example, if I have, a, for example, this, the, this, the, the same scans, I always go uh, for older patients, I prefer Lutatera. And I, because the bone marrow reserve may not be so good, like for somebody who is, for example, 20, uh, 20, years, uh, 20 years old. So there is also very new data about the Dotate. They are surprisingly, surprisingly not published. I don't know why they are not published, but uh, for because we are doing Lutatera for approximately four years, and 44 patients show acute transient increase of catecholamines compared to, for example, if you use the Azedra. How it will be related to clinical practice? Because if you will have a patient with very high catecholamine levels, and they will be almost the same on Azedra, I mean, uh, on the Dotatate as well as the MIBG in terms of scan or scintigraphy, you know, so you will most likely go to MIBG because you will be afraid that if they have a very high catecholamine or metanephrine levels, they can uh, end up with very complicated scenario, hypertensive crisis and heart failure and very difficult to treat arrhythmia. What is also important, and you should know that concomitant use of cold somatostatin analog 
increases efficacy of lutaterap. There was a huge actually fight, you know, whether we should stop it or not. But uh, based on the recent data, no, we can continue with colsomatostatin analog and actually it will be better for patient with lutatera. And be very uh, aware of the uh, fact that, uh, you know, using chemotherapy and then radiotherapy or radiotherapy and then chemotherapy is very complicated because, you know, there is the bone marrow reserve can be very much affected. And I can tell you, I saw several patients who end up with critical situation, practically most of them died. You know, you have to be very careful when you are thinking, for example, patient is not responding to chemotherapy, do, for, for example, radiotherapy. Yes, you can do it. Maybe you, you should re reduce the doses or you should put, you know, for example, uh, some cooling periods, three, three, four months before actually considering either radiotherapy or chemotherapy. It depends what you started uh, actually with. The finally, I would like to say that Belzutifan, Definitely important, you know, for treatment of advanced pheochromocytoma paraganglioma. I will not go into that because there was so much, you know, uh, said, you know, about Belzutifan and it was very well and very um, uh, discussed in, uh, in many details. But what is interesting, what we are still missing about the Belzutifan and pheoparaganglioma, at least, you know, what I told you about the polycythemia, that those patients are presenting with some other abnormalities. For example, eye abnormalities. They are presenting with the abnormalities in CNS. They are presenting with somatostatinoma. Would belzutifan would be good actually, or would be there, you know, some good, uh, interesting um, responses of these patients to belzutifan. Unfortunately, Merck closed the uh, trial, I think, too early. And uh, so the patients, you know, with, for example, this type of uh, presentation may not be included or were included only, you know, with certain, certain limitations. But I think that that would be very, very important because if we can treat and what, for example, Dr. Iliopoulos said about the hemangioblastomas, you know, and it was very interesting talk. So the same, you know, I would expect that it would happen, you know, for example, with the retinal lesions. We have also some interesting with temozolomite and temozolomite or olaparib. I will not go into that, but I just wanted to say that these combinations can be very interesting because in some patients with apoxia signaling pathway, actually the mitochondrial complex one can be elevated to increase the so-called NAD. Uh, that is very important actually for PARP1, uh, uh, and PARP1 is very important for DNA uh, actually repairing. So we actually uh, using TMZ is sort of contraproductive. And if we put the olaparib that actually the inhibiting PARP1, it can, uh, can be good. Uh, and especially, of course, in patients with metastatic pheoparaganglioma. I will not go into details uh, because we don't have so much time, but we opened the clinical trial here at the NIH and cannot tell you about the results because we opened it just recently and we will see, you know, what's going to happen. And of course, you know, I told you we have the Lutatera treatment. This is the first treatment in the United States, but I think it's worthwhile for progressive pheochromocytoma paraganglioma. So be aware of that. Uh, and so we are definitely accepting those patients. Uh, but they have to have a progressive disease. And I wanted to tell you that the results are very, very promising. Lampara, you know, using, for example, andreotite, that is uh, also very, very interesting. And uh, also axitinib that would more be towards the VHL. We have uh, several patients on axitinib with, with VHL with some good promising data, but uh, I know that uh, several of you uh, talk about tyrosine kinase uh, inhibitor, so I will not go into the, the details. So final final slide, you know, is uh, what is the what are the future goals consideration? I would say definitely immunotherapy. I am big supporter of intratumoral immunotherapy that actually. Mm -hmm. uh, activate both innate and adaptive immunity. I'm not a big supporter or only to 
activate adaptive immune responses like you know we are always talking about you know pd1 pdl1 ctla4 etc i think that you know for the best response you need to activate the innate immunity and of course metabolomic single cell sequencing you heard something about single cell sequencing uh, at the beginning about the seven clusters that definitely help but also, you know, we will be looking at the new cell membrane targets. We are already looking at that artificial intelligence that that would be important using, for example, alpha emitters or, you know, combination of alpha emitters with, for example, dotatate that, uh, or azedra, uh, which, uh, which may be, uh, or lutatera, which may be very interesting, and of course, tumor uh, microbiome. So finally, I would like to thank you know many many members of my labs of so many scientists attendings here at the nih without them i would never ever be able you know to put you know things together you know with my group but also with collaboration of others here at the nih many thanks to outside NI, uh, nih investigators and finally <clears throat> i would like to thank my wife michaela because you know so uh to put everything together and um, to work in a little bit different directions, you know, and to provide comprehensive care to these patients, you know, is keeping me quite a lot from, you know, being at home, you know, on the regular hours, you know, I'm usually here. So, so I would like to thank her for her wonderful and exceptional, uh, exceptional support and understanding of my work. And I will finish here. And once again, you know, it's really great pleasure, honor, to be here and once again thank you so much for the invitation i very much appreciate it thank you thank you dr pika for such a wonderful um, update on field paraganglioma uh, there are a few questions um the first one is could you please comment a bit more on the nih data you mentioned pertaining to a higher risk of malignancy of field paraganglioma in the setting of sdha sdhd and hdac germline mutation as well as how that informs your practice in terms of offering surgery versus active surveillance of the head and neck paragangliomas. Yeah, so well, that's that's very challenging, uh, very challenging questions. So number one, you know, in the terms of the surgery, and I think that we published together with Dr. Kebebu, Dr. Nilibu, actually, I think Dr. Kebebu uh, uh, took a lead, you know, in this study, that, for example, if you look at the head and neck paraganglioma, so you usually, for example, I will talk about carotid body because vagal paraganglioma, jugular paraganglioma, we usually don't operate for many reasons, uh, but um, or remove them uh, for many reasons. A carotid body, if we see that the patient has a SDHB mutation, and it's up to, uh, about, you know, up to 1.5 centimeter in the size, we always suggest the operation because there is a high risk of developing metastatic disease. If the patient does not have a SDHB mutation, it's, for example, apparently sporadic head and neck paraganglioma, here carotid body paraganglioma, or if it is related to SDHD, you know, so we can wait easily uh, when the tumor is approximately two centimeter, and then you know we suggest the uh, we suggest the operation. I'm afraid that I cannot tell you so much about the SDHA because unfortunately the data is very 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 limited. Because as you know, the head and neck paraganglioma usually SDHD number one, SDHB would be number two in terms of hereditary uh, head and neck uh, paraganglioma. If we go down, you know, outside the head and neck paraganglioma. Also together, you know, with Dr. Kebebu, Dr. Naris Nilibul, you know, we put uh, some interesting data. Uh, so if you have a patient, for example, with pheochromocytoma related to SDHB, you always remove the, the, uh, the adrenal gland. So we right now suggest, you know, the total adrenalectomy is the way to go. If you have a SDHD or if you have a something else, not SDHA, we don't have enough data. I'm sorry, because they usually present with uh, paragangliomas. Then you do uh, so, actually cortical sparing, uh, cortical sparing surgery. So this would be my answer, you know, to your comments or to your question. Thank you very much, uh, Doctor um, Linehan has a question.
Dr. Linehan, go ahead. Sorry, you're muted. Sorry, I was muted. Carol, thank you very much for a really beautiful talk. Really, really elegant, a fabulous story going back over the years. A real quick question, actually, sort of three part question for you. Um, do you feel, with your experience, there is an increased likelihood of metastasis or malignancy, you want to say metastasis, whatever, or malignant potential for a paraganglioma versus a pheochromocytoma. We'll say independent of genotype. In other words, for yeah. you know, a disease, a pheo outside the adrenal versus inside, number one. Yeah. Number two, you mentioned size, which I thought was very interesting. What do you have a size? Does that go with the genotype? I mean, do you have a size? You know, for VHL, as you know, we don't have that many metastases, but uh, you know, over the past 30, 37 years, I guess, but we have some. But uh, what size do you sort of recommend? And also, I got a little confused on the imaging for, for this pop, for this audience or for this group of people, uh, for VHL, if somebody had an equivocal lesion, we'll say in the retroperitoneum or something or somewhere, and they wanted to do imaging as you were talking about all the elegant new imaging, which of those would you recommend again for VHL? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, so, so you have uh, three questions. Yeah. So about the metastatic, I will lump it with uh, actually size. Um, and then I will talk about also the VHL. So in terms of metastatic disease, uh, so it's, uh, of course, you know, I outlined those factors and size, you know, the matters. If you have a, for example, and regardless what you said, regardless of the genetic background, you know, so let's say uh, even apparently sporadic, uh, pheochromocytoma paraganglioma, uh, if it is uh, over five, uh, five to six centimeter, I would say six centimeter if it is apparently sporadic, you should definitely operate the patient because the um, uh, metastatic potential for this patient is much higher. I will tell you that if the tumor is approximately I would say, uh, and if it's apparently sporadic, because we don't have, you know, for each genetic mutation, unfortunately, yet, and if it is, you know, approximately eight to 10 centimeter, practically 95% uh, likelihood that the tumor will metastasize. If you go back and to look at the genetic background, and especially for patients, um, they have a SDHX, because this is... Uh, like something that we have, you know, some data uh, that those tumors, they have at the same chance if they are approximately between six to seven, eight centimeter. So this definitely the difference between, you know, those, uh, those tumors, but regardless what you said, regardless everything, you know, let's say you don't know anything about those tumors, you only just, you know, seeing the patient with uh, pheochromocytoma. If the pheochromocytoma is eight to 10 centimeter large, you can tell the patient that over 90% chance that the patient will develop metastatic disease. Of course, not everybody will develop metastatic disease, but the chance, the chance is uh, very high. Uh, it's interesting what you said about the VHL. You know, so do we know actually about the VHL and metastatic disease? Of course, you know, if they are, you know, for example, outside the adrenal gland and you know it very well because you put together the program about the VHL, including the pheochromocytomas, paragangliomas here, you know, so you know that they have a higher risk for metastatic disease. Unfortunately, I will tell you honestly, I will not be able to answer what could be actually the size of these tumors than when we actually think that they have a higher metastatic potential. But it's very interesting, uh, very interesting uh, question. I would say they will definitely go to the higher, you know, size of these tumors because they are belong to class to, to hypoxia, but you know, it's a sort of yeah, yeah, cl cl close, you know, we, in terms of metastatic disease, like, you know, close to cluster two, although it's not the cluster two, and they have a very low 
chance of metastatic disease, as you know, for, for example, for VHL is three to five percent plus minus, you know, it can be a little bit slightly, slightly higher. Uh, so I would say that, you know, to be on the higher side and I would guess and only guess, please, you know, would be, for example, about six, seven centimeter that they will have, you know, the higher metastatic potential. But it's very good question. But your sense, but your sense is though, because this has always been mine. But then again, I I don't know, if, you know, if I'm right. But your sense is that extra adrenal, you know, we'll say paraganglioma, yeah, is is more more of a potential malignant potential than in the adrenal than a pheochromocytoma. Is that that's correct? That your sense? That's correct. That's correct. Okay, absolutely. okay, that's kind of what I thought, but I didn't. Okay, that's that's absolutely correct. And the the data is there. Data is there. It's absolutely okay. correct. Yes, yes, you are right. And the third question, imaging, yeah. So imaging, so those those imagings at the beginning, they were done, you know, comparing, for example, Dota 8 FDG or CT MRI Dota 8 FDG, you know, so because, you know, we sort of abandoned fluorodopamine, as you know, we started, you know, uh, doing it together some years ago. But then later on, the fluorodopa was uh, was added uh, based on you know the approval here and everything, and we really feel that and it's also based on the guidelines, the European guidelines that we put together, I think 2020 or so, that fluorodopa is actually absolutely very good and the best imaging study for VHL related pheo slash paraganglioma. Uh, the same is like for EPAS or uh, HIF2 alpha yeah. mutation, because they both are in the hypoxia signaling pathway or close to hypoxia in, under the cluster, let's say the old uh, definition cluster 1B, one, uh, one and uh, the data are pretty much convincing. So if, if and only if somebody has a chance to, the, to perform fluorodopa, I would definitely always suggest the fluorodopa. If not, you know, MIBG can be good substitute. And if not MIBG for whatever the reason is, you know, then of course you will go with the FDG and you can go with uh, Dota Tate, but I would go most likely with Dota Tate scan. Thank and you. As per previous publications, you know. So usually evolving, you know, whatever you have in terms of, you know, the imaging modality. And unfortunately, at the beginning, we did not have so much, you know, to deal with, you know, the fluorodopa because, you know, you know, sometimes, you know, it needs a lot of approvals and everything. And some, uh, sometimes it takes time. For those colleagues who don't have access to fluorodopa or dotate, then they might then use, MIBG, PET, they might use PET scan, MIBG. Yes, and my BG scintigraphy yeah. will be great. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, right. Agree with right. you. Yes, good right. point. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Dr. Mete. Carol, wonderful uh, presentation. I really enjoyed and I also learned uh, new data from my end, which uh, certainly the immune signature is going to be translated in pathology practice in the next uh, WHO most likely. So with respect to my questions, I would like to, uh, to uh, ask one challenging clinical scenario where we do have patients in which you do get succinate dehydrogenase deficiency on immunistic chemistry, and they do develop more than one tumors, and they are usually young patients, but you don't find somatic or germline alterations, nor the epigenetic alterations in the well-known succinic dehydrogenase A, B, C, D, AF2. So do, number one, do you screen for succinic dehydrogenase AF1 alterations? Yeah, so we do, we do. And of course, you know, not everybody has it. Because mm -hmm. I can tell you honestly, you know, it can be hypermethylation of something. Exactly. You, know, like, you know, if you are presenting with, you know, GIST, you know, this pheochromocytoma, you know, hypermethylation of SDHC, mm -hmm. etc. You know, so and very often, I will be very honest with you. Very often, we are clueless. We don't know. So, but they are still like at the multifocality level and the morphological level. They are succinate dehydrogenase deficient tumors. Yeah, like, yeah. I mean, they are succinate dehydrogenate deficient, exactly. tumor, but we don't know exactly. what is behind that. And okay. I hope that somebody somebody will discover with, you know, some other mechanism. With respect to that dilemma, so you mentioned that the SUX-LG2 mutations result in reduced uh, succinate dehydrogenase enzyme activity. 
have you noticed ACTH deficiency in tumors that are SUCCLG2 uh, mutant? And do they have a stage deficient tumor morphology? Like maybe this is a more pathology question, but I think that will be one of the reasons potentially for some of the cases maybe related to other Krebs cycles related uh, regulatory pathways that are actually resulting in reduced ACTH immunostochemistry. They definitely have a SISET SDHA. SDH. Do they show global loss though? Say it again, please. Do they show global loss of cytoplasmic granular ACTHB immunostochemistry? Yeah, they do, they do. Okay. They do. Yeah, they do. That's so that happened. means a such LG2 should be yeah. adding to our existing panels as the standard yeah. of care. Yeah, you know, even the fact that you it, identify per four percent. Yeah, it should be an identify four point three percent. But I think also it needs. A, I would say, you know, because I'm all, always on a very careful, I would say, side or how to say, you know. So it needs, of course, you know, another study, you know, maybe international. No, no, study. I know. Of course, I, you know, what is, what is uh, happening because it needs definitely validation. But I agree with you if it's come like, you know, for, you know, some other genes, you know, including the chromatin, you know, etc. you know, so which was uh, validated later on. And, uh, you know, so I think that that would be really good. Yes, correct. Because I think the, one of the dilemma at this time, like everything depends on access to resources, but Ex yeah. exclusion of the absence of a germline pathogenic variant is nearly impossible if you don't do the whole exome genome sequencing. And even that one has limitations in certain cases. So basically it, it, it's a difficult challenge, especially when dealing with young patients with ACT8 deficiency in which you don't find any pathogenic I, I correlate pathogenic, in your screen. Yes, yes, yes. yes, absolutely. Thank you very much again. Excellent agree, presentation. Agree with that. Thank you so much for your comments. Appreciate those. You're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Pekic. There, there, there are a lot of questions um, uh, uh, that uh, people are asking, but I think um, because of the time, uh, we're going to stop it there. But thank you very much for such a wonderful uh, talk. Thank you so much. And if somebody has a question, you know, they can always send me email. I will be happy to comment about those questions or talk with, uh, with those uh, individuals. That would be fine. Thank you. Thank you so much for Thank offering uh, to answer those questions offline. Thank you. Thank you.